Throughout high school, I thought I knew what acting was. After all, I was involved in several school productions, but I never actually took any classes. I mean, acting is just a simple action of regurgitating memorized lines and sprinkling some emotions to make it seem realistic, right? <laughs> no, I could not have been any more wrong. Years later, I began to study theater here at UT, where I learned the true nature of acting, which involves understanding a character's circumstances and reaching their needs or objectives. Every character in a play or movie has a goal or objective, and every time they're faced with an obstacle, they pivot. Much like these characters, we too have objectives in life. We have lifetime objectives. I'm going to visit 100 countries by the time I'm 60. We also have year-long objectives. I'm going to add 10 new pieces of work to my art portfolio by the end of this year. And we also have momentary objectives. My objective right now is to successfully deliver this speech. And if I fumble in my words, or if I forget my lines, <laughs> if I forget my lines, if I, if, if I forget my lines, I'll pivot, I'll play it cool, and I'll continue. <laughs> Even if you're laying home on a Sunday with no plans for the day, that in itself is the objective. I like to envision that we are all actors of our own life-themed improv shows. Throughout, we're thrusted into the unknown, and throughout, we're constantly reaching our objectives alongside our scene partner, life. We're thrusted into the unknown, and the majority of the performance is created spontaneously with no script to guide us. So, what happens when you're stuck in the middle of a scene with a partner who is constantly putting up barriers, preventing you from reaching your needs, your objectives? I found myself in this situation a couple of years ago. I was miserable and constantly burnt out working as a research technician in a very hostile lab environment. It was a bit conflicting because I loved every aspect of the project in my research. Literature review, planning and executing experiments, data analysis, interpreting results, and communicating those results to a larger audience. My overall goal throughout college was to work towards a fulfilling job that involved learning and teaching. And I believe that working in this lab to gain more research experience was crucial to strengthening my application for grad school. But unfortunately, Hasa lab environment was my scene partner. And with a difficult partner, I didn't know how to progress the scene or move forward with my life. In improv, there are several fundamental rules we can employ to make scenes feel a little less daunting. And with these rules, we can navigate through any hindrances to reach our objectives. After all, improv is about embracing the unknown, living in the moment, and letting your instincts guide you to create something special. And with that in mind, there are five rules that I found to be particularly helpful along my journey that I would like to share with you all today. Always agree? Yes, and? Aim to be truthful. There are no mistakes. Take risks and commit. Always agree. The most important rule of improv is to always agree and say yes to the choices your scene partner has created. For instance, if you and I, if we're in a scene together, and you say, wow, the weather here in Mobile, Alabama sure is nice. And in response, I say, what are you talking about? We're in Austin, Texas. Then it's difficult for my partner to continue the scene. But what if I instead responded to, wow, the weather here in Mobile, Alabama sure is nice. With, I know, exactly. That's why I decided to move here. See? Now we're able to start somewhere because I acknowledge that Alabama is where we're setting the location. It was difficult to admit, but I was going through a quarter-life crisis in this lab. My self-worth was put into question, and I wondered if I had chosen the right career path. I kept looking back, thinking I should have joined another lab instead of this one. Perhaps things would have turned out differently. And I began to long for things that should have happened. It was a constant cycle of creating this false reality that would have been my life. 
But what ultimately pulled me out of this reality, or this cycle, was realizing that the reason we are here today is because of the accumulation of all the choices we've made up to this point. It has led to our successes and our achievements. What builds vitality is knowing you have unlimited choices to get to where you want. I began to view my crisis as a time of awakening, where I was capable of making new choices that aligned with my true values and passions. When we're placed in situations that could have been prevented, we often dwell on what should have, could have, would have happened. You know the frustration that comes after an argument? You replay how the argument went down, and somehow during this replay, you're able to think of all the quick, woody comebacks you should have said moments ago. And then you get stuck in that whirlwind of negativity, right? In those moments, it's important to accept the situation for what it is, reassess, and think how you can move forward. The next rule is yes and. This is similar to the previous point, but a notch up. Someone offers an idea, but not only do you accept it, you also build on it. For example, if you and I, if we're in a scene together, and you say, collecting flowers is so fun, and I say, no it's not, you were literally complaining about collecting flowers yesterday, then we're at a dead end. But instead, I can say, yes, I remember you and mother would always collect flowers every Sunday, before she turned into a giant lizard. I added another element to the story because now there's a backstory to this mother figure. I gradually began to accept my negative lab experiences and channeled my dread of going to lab into humor. And I did so by making self-deprecating yet relatable content and shared them online. <laughs> and surprisingly, I found a community of other researchers who were in similar positions as me. My content was being shared to other scientists and researchers, and we bonded over our similar experiences. We were able to offer and exchange advice on making the most hostile situations more manageable, like laying down boundaries, overcoming imposter syndrome, managing the work-life balance. Obstacles, unfortunately, that are quite common in academia. Over time, labs seemed significantly more bearable, and I finally built up the confidence to apply to grad programs. What I realized is the yes and rule means taking our negative experiences and reshaping them into positive actions. For instance, if you failed your first general chemistry exam, you might feel more inclined to attend office hours or form study groups for the next exam. You can channel your anger and frustrations from work by signing up for a kickboxing class. If you're feeling overwhelmed, you can take a stroll through the park to try and alleviate the mental stress. Positive actions don't necessarily change the negative experiences, but they do allow you to view them in a healthier perspective. The next rule is aim to be truthful. Now, in improv, we're taught don't aim to be funny. Aim to be truthful, and the funny will naturally happen. When you go to an improv show, obviously, you expect there to be comedy. It's tempting to squeeze in a very well-thought-out joke to get a laugh from the audience. But you'd be surprised that most of the time, the joke does not land. Instead, we're challenged to aim for authenticity and to reach a character's objectives through truthful actions. After months of waiting, I finally had the chance to interview with my dream neuroscience PhD program, and I felt so prepared, maybe a little too prepared. As I interviewed with several principal investigators, or PIs, I had a general idea of exactly what type of candidate they're looking for. So, I shifted my persona to make sure I checked all of their boxes. Strong research background, check. Persevering, check. Critical thinker, oh my god, check, check. <laughs> Collaborative, check. And by the time I reached my second to last interview, this alternate persona evolved into the cookie cutter PhD candidate I knew they were looking for. I entered the PI's office, mentally prepared to go through my Rolodex of perfect answers and, rec and recite them each time a question was thrown my way. Yet, instead of them asking me about my research or anything science-related, really, I was thrown a curveball. Do you like Taylor Swift? <laughs> I mean, yeah, who doesn't? <laughs> All right, well, come over here. And just like that, they pull out this VIP Taylor Swift box, the ones you get from a concert if you pay big bucks, <laughs> and started showing me some of the merch inside. I tried to redirect the conversation to what we were supposed to talk about, my science. 
And I remember thinking, this isn't what an interview was supposed to be like. What is happening? And then they proceeded to give me a tour of their office, showing me the little trinkets on the shelves and all the plaques on the walls. And over time, this persona started to slowly fade. And oddly enough, expressing my interest in Taylor Swift was what sparked a genuine conversation between us. Fortunately, the interview went very well, and they're impressed to see that I have personality. <laughs> it turns out the reason why they didn't question my research was because they already knew about my project and had attended one of my talks in the weeks prior. About a month later, I was excited to see that I had received an offer letter from this PhD program. The most important way to connect with others is by being truthful, which requires vulnerability. So how do we embrace vulnerability to build stronger connections? Being communicative and openly sharing your thoughts and emotions go a long way, such as admitting when you're wrong, speaking up when you disagree with someone, and even texting your friend to let them know you're thinking of them. By cultivating this kind of authenticity, the memorable and significant moments will simply be a byproduct of your honesty. The next rule is there are no mistakes. The way Tina Fey explains it is that in improv, there are no mistakes, only opportunities. Now, I can start off a scene pretending to pull on some ropes to open the stage curtains, but if my scene partner thinks I'm milking a cow, then I'm milking a cow. <laughs> if I try to backtrack and explain, hey, hey, I'm actually pulling on some ropes, it wouldn't necessarily move the story forward. I mean, imagine doing this for every little single mistake in a show. It would be repetitive and frustrating. For a while, I would beat myself up for joining the wrong lab, but it only thickened my skin and pushed me to be more communicative. The silver lining was that I found my own um, group on social media throughout my lab experience. I was able to grow this platform and use it as a medium to teach others about certain lab skills and various science topics through humor. Now, this is gonna sound very meta. A couple of years ago, in 2004, there was a rover sent to Mars called Opportunity. Now, this rover was designed to function for 92 days. Somehow, it was able to operate for a whopping 14 years, and the mission finally ended in 2018. Some may say that the scientists and engineers failed because they probably miscalculated something, but the majority of us would say that they were successful in overachieving their goal in this mission. We can carry the same sentiment in our everyday lives. For example, changing career paths or switching majors in college. For some reason, these actions are viewed negatively by society because they come across as being indecisive. Realistically, you're being proactive. You realize you have other passions and you're making a deliberate choice to pursue them. And the final rule is take risks and commit. This refers to making bold choices on stage and sticking to it. That's the important part, sticking to it. If you decide to go out of your comfort zone and give your character a French accent, knowing you cannot do a French accent, <laughs> then make sure it's maintained throughout the entire performance. You can quickly guess that there are going to be a lot of um, hilarious moments where the worlds will just sound completely awkward. But what will naturally make it funnier is if the character um, commits to it. After receiving that offer letter from the PhD program, it was such a monumental moment for me because this was what I was working towards for the past six years, and it all paid off. At the same time, my online educational content was circulating and my social media presence grew. According to an Inverse article, I am deemed the Bill Nye of millennials, which is a bold statement. <laughs> I was receiving a lot of offers to host science shows and YouTube series, but I was unable to commit to them because by this point, I had to make a decision for grad school. I was at a standstill. If I went to grad school, I would want to focus entirely on my studies and put social media on hold. On the other hand, if I focused on social media, I would have to turn down grad school. I took a risk with no plan B and ultimately turned down that neuroscience PhD program I spent so much time dreaming about. I can proudly say that I've committed and boy, the opportunities started pouring in. I've been contacted by America's Got Talent, 
PBS, 3M, TikTok, talent agencies, casting directors from Netflix shows, Discovery Plus shows, YouTube series, and so on. My aspiration of reaching that fulfilling job of learning and teaching was being met with this unconventional job that I had online. Although this pathway was unintended, I was able to commit by utilizing this ensemble of improv rules. I laid a blueprint of all the steps I needed to take in order to reach my goal. But the outcomes of each step kept altering the subsequent steps until I fumbled my way to the goal. Looking back, I clearly did not follow the blueprints that I initially laid out, but what made it so approachable was that I was able to break my overarching goal into smaller attainable chunks. We can carry the same methodology to other objectives as well. I want to lose weight this year. I can start by losing five pounds by the end of this month. I want to start reading more. I can spend 30 minutes each day reading something I enjoy. After finishing these tasks, be receptive of the outcomes and allow them to influence the next hurdles until you finally reach those desired objectives. You know, losing five pounds last month was much easier than I thought. Instead of losing five pounds like I initially planned this month, I'm going to lose seven. In some cases, these outcomes might affect your overarching goals and even refine them over time. The world is a little bit more malleable when you view it from the perspective of an improv show. Life might be the worst scene partner, or it might be the best, but it's completely up to you on how you want to steer the performance. You have more control than you might think. Just remember these five rules. Always agree? Yes, and? Aim to be truthful, there are no mistakes, and take risks, and commit. You have the power to implement these rules to reach those objectives. How are you going to do it? Thank you. Thank you.